So first of all, welcome back everybody. It's been a couple of months. We haven't done any action with the product tank, but we started with a great event today with a great speaker and a great topic. And uh, before I introduce the agenda for today, actually, and I give the word to Patrick, I wanted uh, Mario, uh, who is the host, kindly hosting us here at Inveo tonight. The reason why I decided to pick Inveo, ooh, to pick Inveo as our host today is because, I know this thing is going to keep disconnecting, but thank you, Patrick. It's because it's one of the coolest offices here in Prague, down in Carlin, and they've been super kind to host us, and of course because they have a tag with the beers. Yeah, it's fantastic. Really <laughs> so, all right, so Mario will share a little bit, uh, for those that don't know, Inveo, about what the company is. Okay, thank you, Pablo, very much. And also from me, uh, welcome here in our offices. I hope that you will like it and that you will enjoy your time here. Uh, maybe at the beginning some organizational stuff. If you will need to go and have, uh, want to go to the toilet, you can just use this door. You know that you can go and uh, find your place there. And if you want to take a cigarette, we have an uh, entrance uh, to our nice terrace there. So whoever is interested, you can go and check that out as well. There is a beautiful view from there. Uh, maybe you know for a quick interaction, maybe you haven't heard of NBO yet. Uh, one quick word or like one quick sentence which would characterize this is that we are e-commerce accelerator. So uh, since the beginning of our existence, we've been focusing on the things like how to uh, improve the e-commerce of our customers. We have customers from Czech Republic, from all around the Europe. Uh, I don't know from the names I can mention L'Oreal for the Central Europe. Uh, here in Czech Republic, Glorious Banks, Raiffeisen Bank, Česká spořitelna, Komerční banka, etc. Uh, and we have like some uh, uh, pharmacies, uh, Dr. Max. So we have quite a lot of clients which, who we have helped with the uh, e-commerce strategy. Uh, and we are doing it with hosting our e-commerce platform and also we are helping them with web administration. But one reason why I thought that this is a good fit for us is that we always try to be a little bit more startup-y. So those three projects in the bottom, they are like our proper products. So in reality, we started with the Mailforce as some kind of startup. It started four years ago. It was just for some tests for our clients and now it's a full-fledged solution, which is actually some kind of optimized uh, MailChimp here in Czech Republic. Then Mailitics, which is an analytical platform uh, built on the data which we gathered from the emails. It is also quite an interesting thing. And then uh, one thing which we are specifically now focused on is Dodo. Uh, as you can see, you know, everything is a little bit connected to that e-commerce, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, because Mailforce helps the customers uh, improving their e-commerce strategy by sending the emails. Mailitics is connected to it. But Dodo, I, I can call it as some kind of personal messenger uh, dash concierge, which should help you, you know, whenever you want to have the goods delivered at the same day. So let's say you're going to a party, you don't have time to buy a bottle of uh, wine or flour, so you'll just call us up or just message us, and if within one hour you can have delivered anything you want. So it's not only strictly from the supported stores, but from wherever you want. Uh, and this is quite an important uh, product for us because in reality we think that this is the next level of the retail. A lot of big players are interested in this part and we believe that basically yeah, you can have product which you can deliver within two days but when it, you can deliver it within the same day it's completely different product and we've been able to convince customers such as KFC here in Czech Republic, we are now talking with Mall and some other bigger players who are quite excited from our solution. And you know, hopefully, since it's connectable to whatever services, you might find it as well interesting for your product. So yeah, I'm happy to hear your thoughts, your ideas, and I hope you will find some some way how to find some common ground. So that's everything from me. Again, enjoy the food, enjoy the drinks, and enjoy the presentation. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mario. <laughs> so indeed, it's a, it's a beautiful terrace, so even for the non-smokers, it's worth it to check out. And I believe we're going to have just a short break in between two sessions today, and then there's going to be 
at the end of the meetup towards uh, eight o'clock, sort of one hour for networking. So I believe some of us will be able to roam around without stealing anything and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and check out the offices because they're really beautiful. All right, so uh, was at the product time for the first time in his life. Oh, lots of newcomers, so beautiful. So welcome. Uh, so Product Tank is the largest community of the world on product management, which is being created in order to share the, a little bit of knowledge and to network and to have fun together because it's a super fun crowd. So why not to do it together? Prague is city number 100, joining all these other cities around. So it's just one community and all of them are doing meetups. And in Prague, we just reached actually 500 members that are contributing to this 50K plus of product management around. So uh, the way we structure here in Prague, we have basically three lines, organization, innovation, and evolution, about still product management. And there's uh, uh, the other two organizers, Dave Rusius, who is there. And uh, Stanek Faranay is probably in Norway. Hi, Stanek. We're, by the way, in a uh, live uh, Facebook stream, so people around can see us. Uh, they are running, uh, respectively, the innovation and the organization part. And Paul, I'm running the evolution one. For those that don't know me, I'm a product manager myself. I help multinational companies, consulting them with making product management better, hence evolution. I'm advisor for startups working on international accelerators and started teaching my classes of product management at the University of Economics here in Prague. Uh, so the, the role of this track, Evolution, is about really trying to perfect the practices in product management. And tonight we have one of these practices which is managing customer feedback, which is super important. At the beginning for those that actually, oops, I don't want to show anything, you don't have to see yet. Uh, for those that uh, actually didn't join us a year ago when we started with Product Tank in Prague, we ran sort of a workshop with all the community, or the local community, asking them what were their favorite topics and to vote them. And this managing customer feedback was obviously one of the hottest topics you guys suggested. So we are addressing it today. And that's going to be the first session. It's going to hold by Patrick. I'm going to introduce Patrick in a second and give him the word. As per the second section, it's going to be a short break in between, and uh, it's uh, going to be Prague Product Therapy. It's something we introduced just recently at MSD, a couple of months back, this summer. And uh, basically, we all going to post our challenges on managing and collecting customer feedback. And since we have a lot of experts in, uh, in the room in here, in the community, they will help answering our questions. So. Among you guys are sitting VP of products, product leaders, experienced product managers that can help you actually in the second session uh, answer some of your doubts. As, uh, so all our sessions uh, make heavy use of Slido, so please open your Slido on your phone because you can post your questions to Patrick in the first session on Slido that are going to be addressed in the Q&A of Patrick's presentation. And especially it's going to be needed in the second part, in the product product therapy, to post your challenges in management collecting customer feedback and to upvote them. So slide.do and the hashtag is pdprag. Please take your phone and open it up now because it's going to be needed. So right, so I'll introduce you Patrick. Uh, uh, Patrick's an experienced PM. He's going to start introducing the topic of, uh, of managing and, uh, the customer feedback. And uh, so he's former head of product at Storius, so helping launch the platform. And now he's probably actually, I never usually bring anything personal to, to the stage here, but I have to say he's probably leading product management uh, at uh, my company, Cloud Holding which has uh, gone super well. It's also a company that uh, is uh, meeting uh, startups, an early stage product with early stage, with early adopters in order to give feedback. So it's sort of a fit for today's topic. And uh, Patrick is actually representing the head of product product. So a little word to Patrick and switch the thing. And we'll chat later in the second session.
So please use the Slido uh, PT Prague hashtag to post your questions to Patrick. So good evening everybody. So my name is Patrick, uh, Pablo Menchang. Uh, and thank you Pablo and Product Tank for invitation and also thank you Yuka, everybody. Uh, so firstly, uh, so I prepare this topic. Uh, I just prepare like the slide presentation about the uh, how to manage customer feedback. Uh, I just go through briefly and then we can discuss about what you care. So firstly, uh, something about me, uh, how I'm thinking and why I'm thinking this way. So I was studying software engineering. Uh, I'm in digital field like 10 years. Uh, firstly, I started like a developer and then uh, I was like business, uh, analyst, proje project manager and so on and so on. Uh, I was working for startups, uh, startups, agencies and one com corporation. Okay. And what I'm doing now, uh, we have like pure ideas, it's like a product studio. So we are trying uh, companies to find product market fit uh, as, soon, uh, as soon as possible yeah. and as cheap as possible. And uh, how Pablo mentioned, right now I'm like interim head of product, so my main goal is find product market fit. And we have also other startups like Opa Heroes, but right now it's paused, but we are going to come back soon. Okay. So, um, just about the product management in general, so we are on the, on the same page. Uh, so there is uh, some uh, phases of every startup or every product, uh, mostly it's like uh, finding a problem solution fit, then finding uh, product market fit, then scaling, and then like establishing normal company. To be honest, I never get to establishing normal company, so I'm more focusing on these three stages. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so about the role of product team. Uh, a product team is usually in the middle of like every team, and there is necessary. Uh, there is like good communication with uh, every other department or other team members. And if other departments is not working correct uh, in correct way, uh, it also affect product team. So therefore, uh, it's important to set up right communication and processes with every uh, department or product team. Uh, so, uh, product people, uh, from my point of view, there is like two types of product people. There is like uh, product hackers and product managers. Uh, uh, product hackers, uh, they are focusing on finding product market fit uh, as soon as possible. Uh, they are using like different methodologies. They are usually, they are, they are like multifunctional. And they are used like uh, different techniques, most of them like GP plan techniques. And then there is like product managers. Uh, they usually have like more corporation mindset. Uh, there is usually the bigger team like UX, UI, developers and other, uh, uh, other stuff. And usually they have like uh, bigger salaries uh, but low shares in company. And they, they are using like stable processes, KPI metrics or something like this. So from product point of view, like user needs are at the first place and technology is on the second place. So, uh, and then uh, when you, know, uh, firstly you're supposed to identify like your persona, then you're supposed to like uh, validate your persona by, by interviews or other, uh, other method, uh, method, methodologies. Uh, uh, and then I think everybody knows this process, so then you can start this process. So about customer feedback, uh, so how I mentioned, uh, in every phase of uh, product phase or uh, startup phase, uh, there is like different ways of how to handle customer feedback. In first phase, product solution feed, uh, there is most, you are making mostly interviews because it's like more, most effective and most cheapest way. Uh, in second phase, uh, product market feed, uh, you are still making interviews, but you are also starting analyzing the data if you have some customers already. Uh, and then in scaling phase, you are focusing more on the data, and then in the company mode, you are analyzing mostly the big data. Uh, so, uh, 
So you have to always ask the right customers the right questions at the right time at the, uh, in the right way. So for example, you are asking uh, sign up users like different questions and in different time. And when you have like uh, long-term users, you are also asking them like different questions in different time. Okay. Uh, so uh, how I said, I'm a big fan of interviews. Uh, this should be for separate presentation, but just briefly. Uh, it's more art than process. So when you are like uh, when you are like uh, training it a lot, uh, you can have great results. Uh, there is many problems like biases or something like that. Uh, everybody has his own biases, and there is basically there is like few types of uh, interviews, like persona validation interviews, product interviews, validation interviews, effectiveness interviews, and mostly uh, uh, every interview is like combination of this type. Because you cannot make interviews with customer like four four times per month, so you have to choose rightly what, what you are asking them. And then. Uh, so to, uh, tools would I use? So everybody needs the right tool to be effective and with the results. I hope there will be no problem with the picture. Uh, so basically, my for me, like the most important tool for me is like product work. I think this, like every product manager, should use this at, at least this tool. Uh, so I suppose everybody, uh, how many people knows product work or are using product work? Ah, so great. So everybody knows it almost. Uh, so maybe some hints uh, about the product board. Uh, it's like easy to set up this tool, but uh, it's hard to set up the people and the right processes. Uh, and when you handle, everybody is putting everything uh, to product board. Uh, it saves you time and your nerves later. Uh, for example, we are putting there also like every interview's idea, feedback from sales and marketing. You have to be patient with setting up processes and explain everybody why you are, uh, why you want to do this. And um, uh, like one of my best practices is like uh, naming the components uh, due to customer needs or problems, because then you don't have like biases. Okay. Then crowdloading, uh, we have to promote crowdloading also. Um, so crowdloading is really great uh, at the beginning of your product or of your startups when you don't have any <coughs> customers or paying users. Uh, so you can get feedback and ideas from the crowd. <coughs> uh, you, you have to ask the right questions uh, of the crowd because otherwise uh, you get like shitty answers. And uh, the crowd uh, always don't know everything, but it's like a crucial information stream, mostly at the beginning. Okay. Uh, and then intercom, uh, it's more for customer success department, so maybe we can talk about it, but I think it's not for crucial for pro product people. Basically, uh, for me, like product manager, I just need uh, somebody push information from intercom to product board. Or sometimes I'm, I'm asking, the, I'm answering the question to the clients. Okay. And then uh, in later phases, uh, you can use uh, Satismeter, uh, it's like uh, NPC. Uh, so, for example, after one week, after sign up of your user, you can ask them how they are uh, happy with your product or something like that. And Satismeter is great because it can be like first step uh, to make an interview with that customer. So it's like... So other tools, there is like many other tools. Uh, depends on the phase, budget, and or and your product management style. For example, I like uh, Inspectlet. Uh, it's like uh, screen recording because then I can analyze the behavior of the users. And I think everybody knows Ojar or Segment or other other software. So fuck ups and lessons. So this will be maybe the longest chapter in my presentation. 
Um, so when we started Pure Ideas, uh, we launched also like Stoolnet. It was like online reservation platform. Uh, we started like uh, every Czech startup. We just copied the solution from USA OpenTable. But we were too slow and then Restu, I don't know if you know Restu, but they Restu come and we were fucked up. So we were to be really fast, otherwise you will be the last. Uh, but then uh, we joined to Storios. The problem with the Storios team of the beginning, they had already like a huge amount of data, but nobody was using them. For example, sales team was also doing like the interviews or something like that, but they were like cheating it. For example, they copied the interviews, so it, had, it was like useless. And decision, mostly decision was made uh, due to feelings and not due to data or the customer needs. And they wasn't using like the right tool. I think this is like a big mistake of every startup uh, to try save money on the right tools. So for example, we were using like Excel sheet for a long time. And I think in that time, just product board was starting. We were like one of the first companies using product board. And the biggest problem of Storios was uh, they were focusing on everybody uh, at the beginning. Uh, so, for example, they were uh, developing, uh, sorry, uh, Storios was like point of sale system. And they were trying to reach like a big restaurants, small restaurants and everything. So at the end, uh, everybody was like unhappy. So then we just identify our segments like micro segments small segment and then we just started focusing on uh, coffee coffees and small small restaurants and then we reach like 700 restaurants in few months uh -huh. and then maybe last point it's like be aware of, of your runway and investors because when you lose your majority and company it can be a problem sometimes so know your MVM like minimal variable market and then you can start growing it and processes data and line. Uh, so, so then we started Local Heroes. The problem here was like product management was far ahead to product development. So when you have like a lot of ideas but nobody is developing it, it's also a big problem. And so team members are crucial, quality instead of quantity. And when somebody isn't delivering results, so one, two chances and then you have to fire him as up or it can be like Big problem. Mm. Uh, and now crowdfunding. Uh, I think it's also like big problem when there is like a lot of people from the beginning, uh, because it's not so effective because you have to start some processes or something like that. Uh, uh, problem of crowdfunding a little bit was also there was like bad implementation of MVP. It was like too good for MVP, so they spent quite a lot of time uh, for that. Uh, and then uh, launching sales and marketing strategies without knowing customers and product market fit, uh, it's like losing your money. So spray and pray strategy isn't working in general. So like product first and small fast team at the beginning. And then and like pure ideas clients, usually there is like no problem with them because they are paying. And but they think they know everything necessary, explain everything and be patient with them. And I think like product product hacking is possible to outsource, like to find product market fit and prepare MVPs and test it. But product management isn't possible to outsource and it's best when they have already like own product managers. So, mm -hmm. Okay, so conclusion. Um, so I think uh, it depends really on many factors, like in which, which stage are you, how big team is, how much money do you have, and you have to tailor everything and every time. So if you want to contact me, here is some contacts, and now it's time for your questions, and I try to answer. So thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Slido is uh, slide dot 
DO and the hashtag is going to be PT Prague. So who's never used Slido before? Okay, so, so I, I encourage you giving it a try. I'm going to ask Patrick the questions that you guys post there. And another cool thing is possible to do with Slido. If you really feel that somebody else posted a good question, you can upvote it. So the question is going to go up and it's going to be asked first since we have a limited time. Uh, I'm going to, and in fact, people are starting up voting this one, which is super interesting. So, um, how did you actually uh, segment? You can, you can come over to stay here with me. So, how can you actually segment it, the target group, uh, when you were at store use, if you did use any specific methodology? And well, please just stay in the range of the Facebook Live thing so mm -hmm. that they're going to see you also in Norway. Or okay. whatever else. Mm -hmm. By the way, the event is also being recorded, so if you find it valuable, if you want to share it with your colleagues, uh, we have a YouTube channel that later I'm going to point you to, and you can share it later on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in Storios, firstly, we try to categorize like uh, every segment based on their needs and capacity, uh, and then. Uh, uh, and then we focus uh, on that on that uh, category or on that segment uh, where we can be most helpful and where we didn't have to develop so much. So therefore, for example, we are focusing on uh, coffee uh, coffees and small restaurants because they don't have so big uh, they don't have so big requirements or something like that. And for example, we are also uh, putting stories to Vitopta but it was quite a big problem because they have pretty big expectations and totally uh, so like this. Firstly, we categorize, we try to categorize, find some patterns in uh, every segment and from that we figure out like uh, basically four segments, how I said like micro, small, medium and big restaurants. Then we identify their needs uh, and, um, and, and like this. I think like segmentation from product view uh, from product point of view, it's a little bit def different, like segmentation from marketing point of view. For example, uh, for me, it's important the uh, customer needs and problems and pains and how we are going to solve it. But for marketing, there is also important like the age, country, or th this kind of stuff. But I think product, uh, product or uh, segmentation can be like great uh, input for marketing segmentation and then marketing is working with it a little bit differently. So. Awesome, thank you for the answer. So there are many, many other questions and luckily people are upvoting, so I'm gonna ask those that are being upvoted first. First of all, I'm really proud of, because it actually is about crowdfunding, a company that, by the way, just closed a successful uh, ICO round of roughly $2 million, and now we're really working, shaping the product market fit, thanks to the effort of the team and Patrick. So, they actually ask you what are your views on Kickstarter in order to manage and collect the customer feedback mm -hmm. and uh, is it there the best feedback on future user, is it better than crowd? This is my mm -hmm. question. Yes, uh, I think uh, uh, if it's better than crowdfunding, I think right now yes, because we don't have so big and quality crowd, but in a few months I believe crowdfunding will be much more better because we are trying to improve quality of our crowd and uh, uh, bring their like most experienced people. But uh, in in Kickstarter, I think it depends which kind of product uh, are you going to launch or you are making marketing campaign. I think it's hard to say because for some products uh, you can have like uh, great feedbacks, but for other products the crowd in Kickstarter don't have to be so useful. So I think it really depends on type of the product you are going to put there. But I think like oh, Kickstarter, oh, it's something similar like when you are going to ICO, but ICO it's more for crypto nerds and blockchain nerds or something like that. So when you have some marketing product, oh, go to Kickstarter, but when you have some blockchain based product or something connected with crypto, it's better to launch ICO than Kickstarter. Or Kickstarter can be the first step, and then you can go to ICO. Cool. So I'm not sure if I answer. Yeah. There's a follow-up to the question. Yeah, I don't have one. So I didn't feel anything to manage the feedback. Mm-hmm. So how do you manage? 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so you together, together, mm-hmm. how do you prioritize and prioritize what you put your product mm-hmm. the whole thing? Mm-hmm. So the, the question is, uh, how do you actually translate customer feedback into a better product? Patrick, mm-hmm. you can come back here so we, we see yeah. you also in the rest of the world. <laughs> there are zillions of people watching us from abroad. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, how I said, primary we are using for this like the product board, but the process is like firstly you define like the uh, feature hierarchy, like high level uh, based on the product needs and or pains or something like that. And then you have like in product board, you have like the insight module when everybody's putting the feedback and we are managing it by uh, every product manager. We are only two. Uh, uh, we, we divide it, uh, we divide it uh, uh, every feedback, uh, if it's for startups or if it's for the crowd holders. So I'm caring about the startups feedback. And then we are try- well, Then we processed like every feedback, even if it is from customer directly or from uh, sales guy or marketing guy. Uh, and then we ca- categorize it uh, to the pains. Uh, and then we just uh, I don't know the expression. Uh, then we join uh, this feedback with that pains we are solving in our product. Usually in one feedback there is like more pains or something like that. So there is also feature for this in product board. So from one feedback, uh, you can map it to many, many features in your, in your feature hierarchy. Uh, and, then, um, uh, and then we just prepare like high level specification. Then with development, develop, development team, we prepare a high level estimation. Uh, and then we prioritize the feature for uh, right now only for uh, next two weeks or next month, because we are changing everything like every week almost. And then uh, we made like prioritization committee uh, where uh, everybody from marketing and sales and product team agreed what's supposed to be developed next. So we prepare like uh, everything for that pro- uh, prioritization committee and then we agreed with ho- not whole company but like head of sales and head of marketing what's supposed to be developed in next month. How long do you do these uh, prioritization, uh, when it's like well prepared, uh, it's supposed to take just like one hour maximum. When it's not, uh, when it's not well prepared, it takes longer. <laughs> uh, I think like uh, head of sales, head of marketing, product development, and CEO. That's all. You know, because more people, it's hard to make consensus. Anyway, and we're gonna we're gonna keep exploring on the topic for for all the rest of the evening. So there's these are most the Q&A for Patrick and then in the second session we can dig down like specific methodologies and stuff because there was course there's no one solution for this thing. And maybe, and maybe one more thing, uh, how we are prioritized the feature. So we have like internal drivers, uh, if it like raised the engagement or revenue or something like that. So we put some points there. Then there is like a user impact score. Uh, it's like how many people vote for this feature or, or how many people was asking for this feature. And then we have some strategy, we have, uh, so we have, uh, it's, it's like a combination of this. Okay. So, thank you on this one. So, um, there is uh, a question that reached six of us. So a good thing Patrick did was giving a sort of overview of what we mean by product management, which is super debated, it's not straightforward because it's a very broad topic. And uh, in that one, actually, lots of pictures, lots of boards for what do you think is the optimal size and composition, mm-hmm. composition you probably mentioned it now, of a small product team at the start of the company. Mm-hmm. Many people mm-hmm. avoid that. It's not probably related to customer feedback itself, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's a bit of interest. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, when startup is starting, it's the best, uh, like maybe three to five people, like some product manager, or product hacker, it's, su- it's supposed to be like CEO, uh, some like customer success. I think it's more important at the beginning than sales because firstly you need like happy customers, then like to have like more customers and then developer of course. So minimum three people and then it depends how many people you can reach and how many people you can afford. Okay, awesome. So another question is, uh, uh, it's actually being posted by Daniel, is there, and it's the only one who's not anonymous, this is why I can read all the other questions anonymous. So, 
Uh, a tool that always is brought up when uh, we talk about managing customer feedback is product board. We're lucky to have Daniel who's one of the tool makers in the room. And uh, we, we cited or quoted this, we discussed it in many, other, in many other occasions because it's really used by many PMs. And the question is if there are any tricks to convince top management that the company should be more focused. Because one thing is getting the customer feedback, mm -hmm. one thing is convincing management that you need to steer the mm -hmm. company or the product based upon customer yeah. feedback. Also very much yes, of yes. I think what, we'll, uh, what was working with crowd holding, uh, when I said if you are not going to generate revenue, because I think uh, paying customers is uh, its best uh, success metric. So if we are not going to uh, generate revenue, we are going to uh, die in few months. So I think this is quite good argument for management and founders. And by the way, data helps as well, right? You can argue also on the data you collect. So, um, okay, I was about to read it, but then another one got upvoted and surpassed this <laughs> one, so I'm going to read the last one which is, when do you ignore customer feedback? It's a very good question, because not all the time you do what the customers say. I think, therefore, it's great to have like customer success department. Uh, we have also Henry here, like head of customer success of crowd holding. Uh, and I think this is supposed to be a primary goal of customer success, to filter like bad feedback or something like that. But when, when some feedback is like repeating or something like that, it's great because you know like more users are interested in this feature. But when something, for example, uh, when I'm making interviews, uh, usually the interview takes like one hour and it's like 50 minutes, it's like nonsense things and only 10 minutes it's some good information for me. So you have to be patient and wait for that good information and you have to go through a lot of feedbacks to find some interesting information you can work with later. Awesome, thanks. So another question is still on... And, uh, and maybe one more thing, uh, uh, it also depends from who is the feedback, you know, from which person. Sometimes you don't have this information, but for example, when, when you are interviewing your customer, uh, like well-paying customer or something like that. I think it's more vi valuable like some other thing. Awesome. And by the way, this, uh, so all product discovery and how to actually pull customer feedback and valuable information out of the customer, as Patrick mentioned before, is a separate topic. Dave usually looks after that in the innovation part. Uh, this is more about the broader collecting and management and usage of the customer feedback itself. So it's more of the broader spectrum of things, uh, company-wide, by the way. Uh, so the, the other question is, uh, if you try to keep customer engaged to share feedback proactively, and if yes, how exactly? So we don't want to know how, we want to know also exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, so how to reach the customers that are giving you feedback so for this is great crowd holding uh, because you, you can pay your uh, crowd holders by yuppies it's like cryptocurrency so you have to motivate them somehow and I think it's also important uh, right communication for example if they give you some feedback and later you implemented it so you can write them ah hello so based on your feedback we al already implemented it so when you push that their ego a little bit or something like that they are more open to share their feedback later so you have to give give something to customers so they want to share your, their ideas and feedback i think nothing is for free so also customer feedback is not free Good point. So the, the other very much upvoted one, still by an anonymous, uh, how would you approach testing with some uh, really specific user group that is somehow unreachable to you? So mm -hmm. this is again about collecting, not managing and using, but really about collecting the customer feedback. In this case, it looks like you do not have ability to reach mm -hmm. out the users. Uh, yes. And if I didn't understand the question correctly and the person who asked you want to clarify, mm -hmm. uh, so 
for example, when you have like the application and your main users are like CEOs and it's hard to reach them or something like that? Or they say really unreachable. Who said unreachable? What means unreachable? They are living in different continent or I don't know. Well, maybe it's somebody from Google. So anyway, let's try somebody you cannot get access uh, to. Yes. A group uh, of users you cannot get access to. Yes, uh, I think this is like biggest challenge to find people to interview them or to uh, uh, so I think uh, when you so maybe you have like bad business model or something like that when you cannot reach your customers or uh, on other hand it could be like a really great okay. So maybe for example the system where they provide anonymous feedback other than anonymous they don't get able to contact them back. I like this, like, I don't even know feedback. Uh, I don't even know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, for, for example, app store, app store feedback is by, by definition anonymous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yes, yes, yes. Exactly. Uh, and, you, and you want to have like the like, uh, live touch with them, or you just need some information from this anonymous group? Because for this, you can use like Quora or something like that, and you can man make analysis of this, these input streams. But, and uh, for example, it's like good thing uh, when you find like your competitors, and usually there is some discussions, and, and then you can see uh, uh, who, which people were discussed more, and usually there is like Facebook account or something like that. So this is also one possibility how to reach unreachable people. So just steal it from your competitors or something like that. So if this is the answer. But usually it's like figuring out, you have to figuring out somehow. So I think this is the creative part of that. Okay, awesome. Okay. So can anybody want to? Oh, sorry? Can I add to this a bit? Oh, well, sorry. Um, for example, we, we have a mobile app, and by we get feedback anonymous on the App Store. People are uh, very positive or very negative. And what we do is we actively reach out to the person, say, "This is our support, our customer uh, email." And if you're invested enough in that problem, or if it's really a big problem, then drop us a line, or this is the phone number. Give me a call. And this filters the the, the really bad bad feedback because the really important stuff actually picks up the phone or picks up the email and gets in touch and then that's really really valuable actually in, in such a way so that's how we do it okay cool thanks Dave so um, I'll ask the last two questions because we're running out of time for the session uh, but by the way we will follow up with a similar pattern of posting things on Slido and everybody's collector is going to answer it uh, in the second session so don't despair if your question is not being answered, we'll try to follow up then in the second part. So, one of the most avoided questions here is if you actually always rely on what the end users say or what, the, what kind of features they request when uh, you have to decide what to develop next in the product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really good question and it's always like about the compromise. For example, if Apple would ask only the end users, like we never had the iPhone or something like that. So if you have something really special and you know it will be going to work and you believe it, so you are not, you know, you don't, you don't care about customer feedback so much at the beginning, but later uh, when you will be validating product market feed and you write your uh, you, you write your uh, customers first customers so then you have to rely on this feedback and so you cannot like forget this feedback like for one year or something like that so in the first phases of the startup of the product when you know what you are doing so you can uh, you can afford this but uh, then when you have like bad feedback only so then there is problem in your product Cool. So, uh, last one, since uh, Pavel is uh, running an agency, so you can probably answer this one. So, actually the question is how to outsource the idea generation and can agency actually really help in this mm -hmm. case? Mm -hmm. uh, I think for sure, 
because I think uh, it's like one of course thing. It. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I think like one thing is the idea and other thing is like uh, prepare the solution for that or something like that. So when somebody has the idea and he don't have so much uh, uh, experiences with that in this field or, or in this domain, uh, he can use like external external agencies. But I think external agency cannot save your team or startup for three years or something like that. So I think it's good at the beginning, but then uh, you have to create your own team and follow, follow it. Okay, awesome. So thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you for answering. We're going to have a break. Before the break, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next in the second session. So we're going to have a, a product therapy session where all of you can actually keep posting on Slido and upvoting what are your challenges in handling customer feedback. So collecting is one part that is really tightly related to the innovating interviews and stuff. But more than that, uh, we can focus in what are your experiences and your, your issues in not just collecting, but where do you actually put this customer feedback? How do you make it available to decision makers in your company for your product? And how do you actually turn that customer feedback into a better product? So that's going to be the product therapy session. As you can see, there is a first part where you, even in the break and talking to other people in the room, uh, you can come up with your own challenge at your own company on how actually you organize the customer feedback and you turn it into better products. And uh, upvoting is very welcome there too. And then uh, we're going to pick uh, experts from the room to answer your question and yourself if you want to join and clarify a little bit more. So we're going to take a little bit more time in doing what the guy there, sorry, I don't know your name, uh, was asking uh, exactly, was asking before. So we're going to spend a little bit more time. But for now, we can have 10, 15 minutes break and join some beers meanwhile. So. <laughs> Welcome to the product therapy session. Actually, what I'm going to do is we don't need a stage anymore, so I'm going to place two chairs. This is something like the anonymous alcoholist thing, so you can stay anonymous if you want or, or you can share it with us. So basically how it's going to work is we're going to put uh, some of our challenges, we're going to spend some time putting some of our challenges and uh, some of our problems with customer feedback on the Slido. And then we're going to have some of us in the room, because we have quite experienced people with product management, answering our challenges and our issues. And I'm sorry they uh, fucked up your stick. Oh, that's okay. All right, so this is the Slido, product tech frag. So before actually you signed up, I was asking you on meetup.com a question. How do you manage, collect, and use your customer feedback? And here there are many answers, or some of your answers. I didn't report them all. But many of these things have been already touched. Uh, our tools have been already touched by Patrick in the presentation. And uh, they range all the way from uh, Excel spreadsheet or Nothing. So some examples are, I put the customer feedback in Jira, orderlessly, an Excel-based CRM, uh, the place for customer feedback relies on customer support, customer success, and sales. Uh, somebody from Skype said, we have an in-app feedback, plus we have an online community, plus we do guerrilla testing, uh, Zopim email and Telegram is actually very used in the crypto world. This is an answer from Crowdholding. Are we actually stay in touch with clients? Product board is actually many of the people in the community answered something like product board for plus something or Zendesk plus something or Intercom plus something else. 
Uh, Pavel mentioned a couple of tools. Otjar is quite mentioned here as well. Uh, Segmenta, you all nobody mentioned it, but Patrick, <coughs> and I'm not sure it's uh, it's so much used. So obviously, uh, sort of um, integration between tools is being usually adopted by companies in order to uh, successfully manage and make available the customer feedback. So forget for a second how you actually collect it, like doing interviews, doing surveys, doing this, doing that. But the thing is, and the, the scope of this session is, okay, once you have a lot of feedback, what do you do with it? So first of all, do you make it available to the rest of the company so that it can decide upon it? Is it part of the product design process? Do you actually design the product based on the feedback? Or you collect it, you present it one day on a PowerPoint, you throw it away, and that's it. It does not have any impact on your product development. So, and I believe many of us have some experience and stories. Somebody says, I just collect the insights from the customers, I believe, and shuffle them directly into feature requests. So I have a pile of feature requests pending there, and then what do I do? How do I select those that make sense? How do I aggregate those? Uh, some other people, again, intercom and something else, sales and support, sales and support come back here, direct customer interviews, and then there is this, I don't know who posted, but if it's a room, can clarify to us, a special Trello board of G-Docs. Wow, sounds good. So, uh, user and stakeholder interviews, this is a way of collecting customer feedback, fair enough, but then what do you do with it? And Google Analytics, and by asking them, again, you collect uh, the numbers, but then what do you do with it? And uh, another page of answers. Online form, survey monkey, studies mirror, again, comes back, Patrick mentioned that as well. Uh, personal interviews, use of intercom, uh, research department, collecting feedback on the web, via jar, managing it in Confluence. Fair enough. You, so Confluence is used as a repository, to make the customer feedback centrally available to everyone in the company. And by the way, who should be the customer feedback available to, and why, what they should do with it, is probably a big question to answer in this session. Uh, collect via multiple channels, blah, 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 and managing using Polarium. Of course, everybody pitches their own. Is there anybody from, from Siemens and Polarium in here? Exactly so. Some people use their, their in-house tool to, to use the customer feedback. We were bragging about our own tool before, so we do pretty much the same. <coughs> now we're using also external tools when we understand that, uh, that the solution we have is not like special purpose for building a product out of the feedback. And, uh, and then the last one is very, is very uh, it's an highlight of the answers I got from you guys. Uh, when we are just not told by the client, so the client requests something, the salesperson come to you and we need to ship this feature, otherwise they wouldn't sign the contract, blah, blah, blah. We use a combination of service. Unfortunately, we don't really do much with that. We are just presenting it and then that's it, that's lost. So uh, <coughs> let's keep putting uh, our... Uh, our uh, questions on uh, questions or even problems you can put on the slide or even one of the issues you're having in developing your product so for instance at my company there is I don't know the UX research department they have a lot of customer feedback I never seen it I don't even know what is it and by the way even if I saw it there's no like a central organism in the company that is actually taking action on it or even evaluating it besides the UX people so that's uh, some, some real story, some real world story from, from, uh, from your experience and some real questions you want to be answered. Because I believe that that's one of the biggest pain points with, uh, with all the companies around. So uh, the first question, uh, maybe let's so the first question is uh, so keep keep please collecting uh, questions and points as we speak and then the format of the discussion will be 
the person who asked the question can come here, sit down, and clarify a little bit more about that. And some volunteer from the audience can say, well, actually, I'll tell you how we did it. Uh, so what made you choose product board out of all the tools available? Who asked this question? Yeah, I did. OK, so come and sit. And then <laughs> I forgot my beer. <laughs> so who, who want to come and answer? We have surely Daniel from, from product board. So maybe he's, uh, he's the best oh, one. Or anybody else who want to answer this maybe question? Maybe in a minute. OK. <laughs> So then you, you want to share something about product board and why it should be suitable for managing the customer feedback? You want to answer the question? Oh, someone who chose product board. Or somebody well, else who well, chose product board? Actually oh, okay. directed at okay, the previous go. presentation. Sure. Okay, okay. Yeah, Perfect. Just come over and answer the question. Uh, please, uh, <laughs> please introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Martin Chatsky. More? <laughs> um, I'm a product manager. I used to be a designer, or I still am a designer, because that's like a hard thing, not a profession thing. So, uh, yeah. That's more than enough. OK. <laughs> All right. So, uh, why I chose product board. So a disclaimer, I know I know Dan, I know Hubert, I know Peter Meissner who yesterday was still a product manager at Product Board. But that's that's not actually the reason why I chose it. That's um, that's more like how I learned about it. Why I chose it, uh, I used to work at Good Data and we had a lot of we had a lot of customer feedback and it was all over the place. It was in Jira, it was in Google Docs, it was in email, you name it. And um, the product was pretty complex. There was a lot of there was a lot of components, and uh, once you got to build a certain thing, let's say let's say you wanted to build uh, a way how to uh, set up notifications so you have this task and you don't want to you don't want to just start a blank and start doing all the research because there has been a lot of things people have said about notifications in the past and you just needed to have a way to have it together tied to that notification problem and be able to skim through that and maybe follow up with these people uh, to dig a, a little bit deeper. So for me, it was a way how to, over the time, collect feedback that you might not need at the time the feedback is given, but you will, it will come handy, let's say in a couple months or half a year. So for me, it was a place where, uh, where I can gather customer feedback and organize it uh, by problems and also organize it by different segments of customers and needs, etc. And then it would come handy not only to me as a, at that time, a designer, but also mainly actually to, to the product manager. N not really. Uh, you should be <laughs> <laughs> It, yeah, it, but it's good, guys. Let's make it. Um, this session is very interactive, so anybody, please feel free to, to contribute to the discussion. The the killer the killer thing uh, of product board for me was that if you finish an interview and you have a transcript, it, it's two pages. The usually the person, you, you let's say you, you you have an interview about how do you manage users and set up different rights. But the person goes off and starts talking about how how uh, how painful it is to set up, let's say, visualizations, etc. So the transcript or the interview is is different different topics, and you you have either an option to 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 tear it apart and 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 just take the feedback and put it in all different ways, and then might you might you might end up losing the context because the person was 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 talking. Uh, 
was talking, it made sense actually what he was talking, like one thing was following another. So product board is good at you take the transcript, you put it in the product and you start highlighting different parts and linking it actually to the features or to the problems, to the needs, but still you have the unified view of that interview so you can go back and read it. So I'm not sure if you can do that in Trello, but that for me actually was the killer thing that I could have interviews by person, but also link the individual parts to uh, different needs that the person mentioned. So, and that, that, if I would name one thing, that was the one thing why I loved Product Board, or why I still do love it. Thank you. Okay. Do you, you want to ask something more? Or no, I think it question? was just a, quite a generic question about what is the yeah, maybe, highlight out of it. Maybe you can also uh, uh, help us asking another question, which is still about product board. Is it how long was the process to switch to product board? And uh, yes, how long was the process to switch with the tool? And by the way, this, this concerns product board, but uh, as I was saying, all of us, as you've seen from the answers you guys gave on, on meetup.com, all of us, we use uh, an integration of different tools, those that actually care about customer feedback, to make available the customer feedback center in the company and to, and to work on it. So switching to the tool is actually part of the effort you need to do if you want to manage the customer feedback correctly. But this one was specifically about product board, so how long it took you to switch to it? Uh, actually, I never switched to product board because like, we basically started anew. Like the, there were two occurrences where I, where I was using product board for gathering customer feedback and it was basically starting anew. There was no really capped feedback at the time, so okay. it was for free. Awesome. So it doesn't take too much. It takes pretty much <laughs> the, the effort of 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 the or the will organizing the team around that. Okay. So thanks a lot. All right. Thank okay. you, guys. So we we'll move to the to the next. Uh, <laughs> so should I say something, or there's? Oh, you you can say something. If you want to add something, feel free to add something yes. about the tool. So hi, we are lucky we have the guys who created uh, I'm Daniel, I'm founder of uh, Product Board. Uh, I wanted to say something about adoption of Product Board, and that is, of course, this is just a tool. It's like a tool for your brain. It, it's not going to solve all your problems. And so, like, if you are thinking ado about adopting Product Board, you, you need to have pretty good reason why you want to do it, and you need to understand what problems are you hoping that Product Board will solve for you. And so the approach I would take is, I would try to look at the product management process you have right now at your companies, and I would try to figure out, okay, what is the biggest problem you have right now? And you can figure out that by looking at like mistakes in the decision making you, you made previously. So if you, for example, build a feature that ended up not meeting the, the metrics you were hoping for, uh, or like nobody started to, to, to use, or maybe, it was much more complex and it took much more effort to build it then like try to figure out and map all those like mistakes you two made and try to like understand why you made those mistakes is it because your target segment is not well defined is it that i don't know you have few very vocal customers that are you know convincing your salespeople and those salespeople are then convincing like you and your boss to, to make changes to your roadmap and try to really figure out, okay, this is the biggest problem we have right now and maybe product board might help us because if we implement this change in our product management process, it will make everything better. And so I think there are, for example, two reasons, like two problems product board might help you with if they are the most important for, for you. Uh, one is analyzing like qualitative feedback at, at scale. So if you have a lot of uh, discussions with your customers through like intercoms and desk and you have basically too much data uh, to analyze and understand, this is something that product board can help you with. And then if you need to align your team like why you are building things you are building, 
that again might like breadboard might help you with it. But first, you really need to understand like where you are making those mistakes. That's a, that's a super valid point. So thank you for sharing, Daniel. And by the way, guys, again, uh, I think one of the reasons why we organize these meetups is because then, especially in the networking uh, part, which you're gonna have in 20 minutes, you get a chance to grab a beer, chat with them, chat with the people, and ask what experiences they, they had exactly. And, and they can help you even further, you can link with them and follow up. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Cheers. <laughs> All right, so uh, the top question was made by Pavel. Uh, do you share a wish list of features and involve users into voting? This is very debated. Pavel, you stick here? Yes, you are. Come over. All right, so uh, uh, I'll, try, I'll try actually to answer on that. This is, or to start answering on that, and then it's good to get, uh, to get your views as well. Uh, this is also connected to the one in my view, when do you ignore customer feedback? And it's quite a debated topic. So, do you want to share uh, a list of features and ask directly your users uh, which one they like the most? So, as actually Dan mentioned, uh, the data you collect can be either qualitative or quantitative. So, about voting makes data quantitative. It's pretty much similar to running a survey. Uh, personally, when uh, I need to work on designing what's next in the product, I don't ask users what they want, or I don't ask them to vote the feature. And the reason is, you can ask them about, you can run a survey, which is still quantitative, and ask them about something else, and to, you can count the answer, so it's similar to voting, so it's still a quantitative process. But uh, when it comes down to interviews, for instance, I try to understand, uh, rather than which features they will like, what problems they have that the features they will like address. So in my view, users are not super good at telling you what to build directly, but they are good at, uh, as actually Patrick mentioned, if you squeeze them a little bit, they're gonna talk one hour, and in that one minute, they're gonna finally say the thing they really need, or the problem, they, the burning problem they really have. So I try to extract that kind of information from the end users, rather than tell me directly what's the solution. Because one of the reasons why you actually collect customer feedback is to sort of distill it and understand what are the problems. And this is, in my view, one of the reasons why you should make all the customer feedback centrally available <coughs> and you should brainstorm, as actually Patrick said, he called it like prioritization committee. Uh, the, 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 the concept is, uh, is being introduced actually by the Silicon Valley product group as a product concept. Again, you take people from all the department, marketing, sales, support, whatever, and uh, they try to brainstorm on understanding what are, all the, what are all the problems that come from this user feedback and try to understand how to prioritize them. That, that's my take on it, but maybe you, you add something more specific on it that somebody else can help answer it. I'm just curious because I can see this like often uh, for especially technical products like where is databases and so on, uh, there are like uh, public, uh, how to say it, bug trackers uh, and users can upvote or downvote what they would like to fix first, so this is some kind of wish list, sometimes there is like even feature list, not only bugs, so I'm just curious about how you guys, uh, what do you think, if you would even like make this information public, the, the collected, collected feedback, uh, your, priorities, your prioritization, uh, what can be the consequences, for example, um, if, if uh, you make uh, the prioritization public and some feature, very complex one, uh, will win, uh, you probably will have some problems with managing customer expectation because it can be like the top priority for years because it's too complex. So. 
I'm just curious. What do you think? Okay, so uh, this is actually uh, <coughs> quite of a debated topic. So it was popular a while ago to to involve uh, users in directly voting, upvoting, downvoting, what features they would like. We even had a presentation, I think, two years ago. What does the audience think? Yeah, at the, at the product management community about Peter, who was the solar wind uh, PM, uh, that actually brought us a view on how they managed to involve the community of users to vote the features. So I'm curious to hear if there's somebody who still does uh, that. So you can bring us your views. <laughs> right, so I should talk about that. <laughs> the sure. biggest problem that oh, I... You can introduce yourself. So uh, I'm Jamie. I work at the moment at ADP, which is a, a, a big payroll company uh, just opposite uh, down the way. And I work as a weird mix between a project manager, a product owner, and a fix-it guy. So uh, very, uh, very scattered and very unfocused. The biggest problem that I've found where I work is that if we get the feedback, um, or we have the information on the product, and I might be dealing with feedback on 20 or 30 different products across five or six different countries, nobody actually listens to it. We don't have a clear owner. And it's very easy for that to become lost in the deluge because we might hear it from several different channels. So yeah, for me, putting it on our client community uh, so that we can see what the, the clients are telling us they actually want is good. And it also allows us to weaponize the really big issues that we're ignoring. For example, lack of SSO is, is a huge problem for us. So you, yes, you asked about uh, communication. You have to be quite careful. But if you're quick and you're monitoring the channel and you say thanks for letting us know, uh, earlier on I think you mentioned just offer to get in contact with them, it's really helpful. I've, I've never had any problems by putting the information out there. I've only had positives come back um, and been able to get some like, quite big changes done quickly because it's never been in the public domain. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that's you know, life at a big corporation, you have to sometimes weaponize feedback. Is it like direct engagement of the customer or is it some kind of moderated? Um, both. So we do have moderation but we, we try to use a, a, the lightest touch possible because the moment you start to censor people, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge problem. It's worse if you censor them heavy handedly than not at all. We, we don't have a problem with trolls. We, 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 we have some, um, you know, they might be around billing. If there's a billing mistake, they might have a bit of fun with us. But you know, usually uh, people are quite responsible. It, that's my, my opinion. And if somebody's trolling with you, you can either have a bit of fun. If it's like that one percent that you can have a bit of fun with, or you just the classic advice: don't feed the trolls. <laughs> but sometimes, yeah, it's fun. Cool. Thanks a lot, Jamie. Oh, that was answering the question. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thanks uh, a lot. Sorry for not introducing myself. <laughs> I'm Pavel. So Pavel Blas is also product manager who's long time part of, of our yeah. community. Yeah. Now I'm Scrum Master. <laughs> now Scrum Master. Okay, so I would like to take to, to a question that is that is very interesting. I don't know who asked it. It's not being so much upvoted, but I'm trying to pick something from the bottom of the list as well. Actually, two people are voting this one. Uh, starts as a problem when you have a large amount of similar feedback which might seem reasonable to consider but the management reject this as unimportant who asked this is a beautiful question come on Yeah, my name is Jan, I work at Expats, and I'm basically a product manager, I guess. So. Fantastic, Jan. <laughs> Many different things, by the way, because we're a very small company, so... Yeah. So that's, that's a great question, who can pick on that? So, never happened to you guys. Daniel, go on. So I believe, <laughs> I believe this, is, this is a topic quite dear to you, right? Uh, so well, the I management says, we don't care about your feedback. Well, there might be a lot of reasons for it. And so I'm not going to go into all of them, but assuming that the feedback is coming from a like, target segment that is yeah. important. Customers, let's say in this case, I was referring yeah. to customers more than users. Then So customer-based feedback. Then there is like one difference I've experienced is 
like if they are just reading the feedback, like if it's in product board or Google Docs or whatever, mm -hmm. then the impact might be not as good as if they are on the actual interviews themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I um, I've seen a lot of companies where there was dedicated security, uh, I mean, um, not security, uh, dedicated like researcher that went out and uh, like those those people would be like going uh, talking to customers mm -hmm. and gathering a lot of top information and then nobody would read it. So they wouldn't use it for actual, actual decision making. Yeah. Maybe I should clarify, because yeah. in our company, for example, we have obviously the sales team in contact directly with the customers. That's where they actually source a lot of the feedback. Yeah. You know, so you meet with them on a daily basis, large clients, small clients, it varies in size. Uh, one of the problems I think um, we might possibly have sometimes is that you basically have all this information. I often see it myself because I also deal with customer service, uh, meaning both clients and users. So I tend to compile things that come up more often than others and I push them up in priority and because I also do development, so I see both both, both mm. of the sides. But <laughs> but what I mean is, if you manage to narrow it down. Let's say yeah. to some topics which are common to a lot of questions that you get, or a lot of complaints, and those topics are then presented, right? Uh, whether it's person to person or more people involved within the company. But I often find that sometimes you present, you know, valid um, information, but then, for example, for various reasons, the management may say. Yeah, that's interesting, but it's not really important at this stage. But you tend to get that feedback over and over again. And often, <laughs> you actually do end up losing some clients, for example, because of one particular issue that has been repeated over and over. Yeah. So it, it's kind of maybe, maybe like, I didn't phrase it correctly, but it was more about tips. I guess it was mentioned before as well. Yeah. Uh, tips on how to. Well, so before before Daniel answers, I actually would like to call two more people on the stage because we have two very similar questions to this one. So I, I'll give my seat uh, up for who, who asked, how do you handle opinionated founders that know better than your customers? <laughs> Come over, Marco. And then somebody else asked, uh, any advice for dealing with people slash managers? They mostly meant managers than people. <laughs> managers are not actually people, we can say that. <laughs> that, uh, uh, that don't react to customer feedback. I believe it's sort of the same topic. So who asked that one? That's me. Sorry, I just came around. Come on, Jamie, just sit, sit, sit with us again. And, and Daniel, sorry to interrupt. Go on. Yeah, well, uh, my suggestion was just get them in front of the customers. Mm. That's it, I've seen that, like, uh, the, like those managers would read through like ten feedback and they would say, hey, man, oh, it's not it important. And then, when and then they, they would see single customer like in person, and then suddenly it would gain very important. So, yeah. I mean, uh, the problem that we're facing is we have two people of different opinions of them. So you know, you may have one who meets with the clients on a higher, uh, basically owner, for example, and then you may have another owner who has a different opinion. So it's then also a fight, an internal fight, between two opinions based on the same feedback. And that's obviously, it gets more complex than that, but, <laughs> yeah. I got maybe two things to add to that. Okay. You can go sit here. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, hi, Marco. My name is Brano, and I'm product manager at Kentico. And so Marco, Jamie, feel free to, to add also to the question. Go on, Brano. Yeah, uh, so one thing that uh, product would help us it was that uh, we aggregated feedback from multiple sources, mm -hmm. like from sales, customer success, and so on. So we eliminated this kind of bias that uh, sales guy came to a meeting and said, that, hey, I've heard it so many times, and yeah, show us, show us the notes from the mm -hmm. sales pitch. Well, there was none, yeah. nothing. So, I mean, either you do your job great, or, I mean, we cannot talk about it, uh, relevantly because we are collecting feedback like, sure. from multiple sources. So uh, that was one thing from the one spectrum mm -hmm. of like prioritizing the features. And then the other one that you have mentioned is that, hey, like you have the clashing opinions. And well, for that, we have something like, uh, we have uh, different drivers for uh, uh, the jobs that uh, we are collecting. Like sure. uh, we, we are not categorizing product and features, but in what kind of jobs uh, do people want to do. Mm -hmm. And every job uh, has a, a different different weight from a different angle. 
like uh, some if we if we start fulfilling some of the jobs, we will uh, get our acquisition higher. Mm -hmm. If we get uh, ourselves fulfilling other jobs, we may uh, lower the churn or keep the retention. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you say. Uh, if we start uh, fulfilling other jobs, we may uh, going to get the cut of an enterprise deal, mm -hmm. and so. On. So we have those different ways, and uh, for uh, three or six months forward, we are just saying that like, uh, okay, so for the upcoming months, we would like to focus on uh, uh, starting uh, expanding our market in an enterprise. Mm -hmm. So we wait those jobs that are uh, that have enterprise potential more over the other jobs. Sure. So it's not like, hey, I like this feature more, or I heard this uh, feature yeah, more, because until you set out your strategy, everything is rel relative, mm -hmm. even though it has like many more goals. So, for example, uh, and I was in a different situation, that uh, one uh, guy at the customer success team uh, came to us, to product manager, said that, hey, why, do, why are you not doing this feature? I mean, this was requested so many times, but yeah, well, it was. But we are not now focusing on uh, this kind of retention that uh, uh, this job will fulfill. Sure. So, I mean, uh, it's it's sometimes it's difficult to say no, but uh, well, someone has to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> there's a question you asked how you dealt with clashes, and for me, I would ask: Are they up the chain or are they down the chain from you? If they're down. I always try to let them get on with it as much as possible. No, it's above me. Yeah, if, it, if it's above, the only thing that I've found that helped me, I'm not saying if it was a good outcome, if it helped, uh, helped me personally, was to just make sure that they had all the right information. Mm. Say, so, have I told you exactly what you need to know? Have, have you got any questions that you need? Have you got the data that you want? And then I would just try to get the two of them together, and I would just assume that I was the chair of the meeting, and I'd say, say, you think this and you think this and I'll try to summarize th their view and I'd say okay so what are the benefits for this what are the benefits mm -hmm. of that and then I'd, I'd act dumb like oh yeah I, I see the I see why you don't understand each other usually there's one person that's uh, looking in my experience more holistically and there's one that's more looking internally at the difference yep. and you have to try and just get them to agree and usually say okay I'll get back to you on that and provide information a few more times but you're never going to hit that, in my experience, with one meeting or one call. Mm. It's a couple of back and forths, and you just have to partner with them. And usually, eventually, uh, one of them <laughs> just gives in. <laughs> That's usually what it comes down to. Because they're usually two good ideas that they're clashing over. It's not, never been a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Marco, you want to add uh, any other angle to, to the question that Brown or somebody sure, else yeah. can answer? Uh, anyway, I'm uh, Marco, head of product at Brand Embassy. Uh, what we use as, uh, I want to add to what you were saying, what, what you, we use uh, uh, in case you know there is some disagreement about how to prioritize. Uh, we have a validation board. Uh, there's uh, basically representatives of all departments, sales, marketing, development, UX, you name it. And uh, uh, whenever there is uh, a customer you know, requirement or it comes from sales or from customer support, uh, what I do is I ask you know, the representatives to come and validate. And that's basically a positive exercise. It's bas basically ask them, why would you do it? Now obviously the guys that are not interested, they're not going to validate. They're going to say, I don't think this is a good idea. But typically, out of the, I don't know, six, seven um, representatives, there are always one or two, sometimes three, that, that are going to, you know, uh, uh, show the rest why this is a good idea. And so it's much less about the specific requirement, but you get down to uh, the indicators that you were talking about, like, uh, you know, this is a requirement that's going to impact our retention, right? And in that case, the, the discussion is no longer about the specific requirement, but you take it a level higher and you say, yeah, you say it fits in our current strategy. So it's sort of in line with what you're saying, but uh, maybe a bit more bottom up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, guys. I guess you answered to each other quite enough. Yeah, I got, so I got more than that. We can, we can, <laughs> so we can skip to, to the next question. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you all of you. Cheers. So, 
Okay, so I have uh, quite of different questions that are about analyzing customer feedback. The questions are different, but they say pretty much the same thing, which is uh, how do you actually keep from uh, confirmation bias when you're asking questions with interviews or surveys? And another one about bias is how would you filter bias from customer feedback, for example, personal preferences and habits. Who asked these questions? So you can come. Who asked the second one? How do you filter bias from customer feedback? Personal preferences, somebody left, maybe. All right. So this is about analyzing or actually collecting the feedback. How do you keep bias? So can uh, anybody answer? I know, I see a couple of faces in the room that they know the answer probably. So does anybody volunteer? Kaba, do you know anything about bias during interviews? No, it's very complex. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like yes. So, so give, us, give, us, give us a hint. All right, so how the, the thing is, the question is, that's not your one, how do you filter bias from custom feedback, your one was more precise, is uh, <laughs> when asking questions within service or interviews, how do you keep from confirmation bias? Yeah, and no, I'll explain a little bit more on what you heard. You can see the most comfortable chair. I was hoping it's my <laughs> um, Was that you guys were talking about like, oh, 99% of the interview was this, and, and then 1% was like golden feedback. And I understand that like sometimes it's like, innovative idea or something that you never thought of and those type of things. But sometimes those ideas that you seem to be great are really just ideas that you like or you had and you're just like, oh look, see somebody else had it. So how do you keep that from reacting that way or digging deeper into certain things where it was just a reflection of yourself? So anybody? Volunteers? So also maybe me. Patrick, please. Lucky enough, Patrick is still here, <laughs> so give us some hints. Okay. Uh, so I think it depends how I said on the type of the interview. When you are asking, like when you are making like pre-product interview, so you have to ask like open-ended questions and not about your solutions, but mostly about their problems and how they are working. For example, when we were interviewing the restaurants. We were just asking uh, what they are usually doing, like in normal day, what was the biggest problem they were solving, uh, what is the biggest problem they are solving right now, what was the biggest problem they were solving like last six months. So I think mostly it depends on the questions and how you are asked them. Because when you said, ah, so do you like our system or something mm -hmm. like that, so that's your confirmation bias immediately. Yeah. That makes sense. But from the surveys, I think it's harder when you have only the data, but it also depends on which type of questions are you asking. Mm -hmm. So mostly like use open-ended uh, questions and then I think you will not have the biases. I would definitely plus one that myself. So if you start asking directly for a solution, is it cool, do you need this, uh, try to click on this is one thing. If you ask more about the user, the problems, their context without mentioning what you're trying to achieve, uh, by the way, I think the next meetup, Dave, it's going to be on jobs to be done. Yes. So all these interviews, things, and product discovery in general belongs as well to the jobs to be done uh, trend. And the next one, so in a month from now, if you want to dig deeper in uh, how to squeeze information uh, out of users, uh, we're going to have a, a meetup on that. Does, does Patrick answer address the question? Yeah, yeah. No, that really makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Can I right? one, one, oh, day, one, day, one quick book tip? Go on, go on. Uh, I also, Daniel is a huge fan of jobs to be done as well. I would highly recommend this tiny book called Mom, The Mom's Test. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with jobs to be done, but it's great. Uh, it can teach you how to ask questions where even if you would ask your mom, what she thinks about your startup, she wouldn't be able to say something like, yeah, it's great. Yeah, great. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it helps you design questions in a way that you'll get the relevant feedback back regardless of who are you asking. Okay. Okay. That's who in the audience is doing surveys? Okay. <laughs> so I think most of us are doing surveys. So, so 
I would like to hear some examples of things you've seen working or doesn't work, or if you ended up in the bias or not. So, from the people that are doing service, what did you learn, or what works for you and what doesn't? Well, maybe. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just, just come over and sit down. Okay. Who are you and why? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you can stay because you asked for services. Right, so yeah, don't be there. Be there alone. The question, so, so yeah, hi, I'm Petr from AMC as Davis. Miss uh, product so, práce, his product. I took over it. It's not much better. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we we just starting doing or trying to do continuous interviewing with people. Uh, we've actually, uh, I've actually took a course from Teresa Torres, new fan, and it's, it's a similar thing that, uh, and I forgot the name, but he was the speaker today, uh, ask for stories. Uh, what did you do at the morning and go from there? Depends on what you want to know because I'm responsible now for a job board and uh, people are looking for the job all over the day. So that makes them open up and not being biased. And from what I've learned, you will never ever get a perfect interview because people like to talk around everything. And it's kind of hard to keep them on the, on the spot or on, on the talking. So that's the problem right now I'm having to like not be rude, something to interrupt them in the middle. So yeah, it's like one hour of talking and as people said, like 10%, you get something from it. I wouldn't even say gold, but uh, maybe through, through time there will be some gold. And uh, yeah, stories is for me a solution right now uh, to, to go through that and people will open up and st stop thinking about it because it, then it starts to be a little bit too much complex for them to actually try to be biased or try to lie because they will have to remember, okay, so what was the last time you've been looking for work? When did you do that? Why? Why was it this time? Why uh, did you choose this service? Okay, what was the problem there? Did you have any difficulties? And um, people will start talk and talk and talk, and you can go for this uh, like five times. You can ask for the same question. Uh, so, what was the the time before you actually do, did this? And uh, if you're lucky, people will talk, and they mostly do, which is kind of strange for me at least, because they really open up at least so far. So, yeah. Okay. Cool, thank you very much, guys. <laughs> this was the last... Uh... <laughs> thank you all. So this was the last uh, question and answer today from our product therapy session. I hope you enjoyed it. There are many, many more questions on the slide. Uh, we may want to publish that in the days to go, for instance, on the Facebook or LinkedIn, and the group and the community can uh, try to answer them online as well. So thank you guys for coming. We still have uh, uh, we still have uh, one hour roughly until now. Until nine, we can hang out a little bit. Beer is on draft, and uh, Mari is still with us. Uh, so thanks again, a huge thanks to to Invil for setting this up all of us. Thank, thank you for coming, and uh, thank you today, Van Zdaniek, to help organizing this. And uh, we're looking forward to see you in a month from now on a deep dive on jobs to be done. And then after that, we're going to keep rolling out more product tank events for you guys. So thank you, everybody.